have uh, your Bibles, you may want to turn to Matthew chapter 6, and I want to read uh, the final end of the prayer. Now, if your study Bible is like mine, um, several have uh, relegated the, um, the end of the prayer to the footnote. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's the end of the prayer. Uh, let's talk about that for a minute. Um, the way the NIV has it ending at verse 13, deliver us from the evil one, and then that's the end. Of course, it doesn't sound like a prayer with it ending that way. Uh, obviously, it sounds like it's a little short or missing something. Uh, but in the best and oldest manuscripts that we have, that's where it ends. So then you ask, okay, well, how did it come to be that we have the longer ending that so many of us are familiar with? Um, let me just suggest um, maybe a little bit of information that might help you just to be aware of this. Uh, to start off with, um, the Coptic church, which goes back to the third and fourth centuries, um, in northern Africa, we have in the what's called the Sahidic, which is southern Coptic um, manuscripts of the New Testament, the Fayumic, which is another dialect. There's actually five or six dialects of the ancient Coptic language. But those manuscripts lack the expression the kingdom and. So they have everything but the kingdom and. The Curatonian Syriac, which is the second through the fifth century, and that's in lower Egypt, lacks the expression the power and. It has what we're used to, but it, it omits the power and. Um, there's an old Latin version that's, that's very, very old and ancient. For thine is the power forever and ever, is how it ends. And some Greek manuscripts expand it forever into forever and ever. Uh, and then, of course, almost all of them end with uh, amen. And then there's, there are several manuscripts probably that date around the 6th and 7th century. They took this prayer and the manuscripts that we have turned it uh, into an ending with what we would call a Trinitarian ending. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit forever. Amen. So it, it was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit added. Uh, and that actually is the same expression, if you, if you research it, of the Lord's Prayer uh, that is part of the Russian Orthodox Church. If they pray that prayer today, that's how they pray it. It's interesting to think about how to end a prayer. Um, watching a movie one time, and it was a family gathering. Uh, must have been Thanksgiving. And a family member was invited to say prayer. And it was obvious in the movie that this person you know, didn't know much about God, didn't know much about the Christian faith. But they said, okay. And uh, it said something like this. Thank you for the mashed potatoes and the turkey. And then the person, you know, raise their head up, look straight up as if you're looking in the sky for where God is. I'm done. <laughs> and I've always thought of that through the years. You know, how do you end a prayer? You know, you tell God, I'm done. Well, when we think about ending a prayer, we're going to look at why uh, this seems to be a significant ending to this prayer. Uh, the final thoughts in this prayer uh, relate to giving God the glory that he so richly deserves. And there is what we call uh, a triplet uh, of, of royal language of kingdom, power, and glory. And remember we've talked about that when Jesus offered this prayer to his disciples as a model, He's trying to help them get their minds around what is significant in your prayer life. And there's something to be said about giving God glory, thinking in terms of kingdom, power, and glory, and that being royal language to the king of heaven and earth. And, and we're going to talk about what that means here in a little bit. And it's interesting to think, too, 
of how Jesus demonstrated all three of these areas in his own ministry. Kingdom. Not only did Jesus proclaim kingdom, he embodied kingdom values. He lived out what the kingdom is supposed to look like. Uh, I've often thought about this because sometimes we talk about the kingdom and church kind of being the same thing, and they do overlap. Uh, how would you like to live in such a way that someone would point to you and say, there goes the church? That's the way the church ought to be, and they point the finger at you, and you're like, whoa, you know, I'm, I'm human. I make mistakes. Don't point the finger at me. But when we point the finger at Jesus, there goes the kingdom. He was all about God ushering in the kingdom, living in such a way to give God the glory. Um, Barclay is of the opinion, and I think there's something to this, that the reason this ending we've talked about ends up being a very, very old form that gets passed down through the centuries. He says, ultimately, in the church, it became part of the prayer because it was the response of the congregation to the first part. I went, oh, now think about that. If you would have someone standing in the assembly reading the first part, and then when he finished, the congregation as a whole would say, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That makes sense. So that ending is a response by the congregation to the one reading the first part. Now, some people believe this is interesting too, that the Lord's Prayer is Jesus' adaptation of David's prayer. When David was making the preparation for the temple, which his son Solomon was to build one day. Uh, you don't have to turn there, but listen to 1 Chronicles 29, 11, And listen to how much language is very much like what you hear in the Lord's Prayer. Here's what David prayed. Thine, O Lord is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and on earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as heaven above all. And so some people think with that being deeply embedded within Jewish thinking about giving God glory, that perhaps this served uh, at least for a way for Jesus to think about this part of the Lord's Prayer, and that's where it may have come from. But this conclusion of the Lord's Prayer reminds us of two important things. To whom we have been praying. And I know it's a short prayer, but it reminds us to whom have we been praying. The God of heaven and earth. And if prayer is to be complete, we have to give as well as to take. See, think of how much in the prayer... There is asking, requesting, and this ends the prayer with not just asking, but giving. Giving God the glory that God deserves as you finish the prayer. Okay, as, as we begin, uh, let's, let's take a moment to look at how This Lord's Prayer was used in the early church. And I say the early church, we're looking at 2nd century. In the document called the Didache, or the Teaching of the Twelve, listen to how whoever the writer is, we don't know who the writer was, uh, and I think I've noted, um, most people think it was a writing that occurs right after the end of Revelation, that the uh, common dates for it, are given like 80, 100 to 125. But here's what the writer says. Let not your fast be like the hypocrites, for they fast on Mondays and Thursdays, but you're supposed to fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. <laughs> and <laughs> every time I read that, I get a chuckle. And do not pray as the hypocrites, but as the Lord commanded in his gospel, pray this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so also upon earth. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive, us, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into trial, but deliver us from the evil one. 
For thine is the power and the glory forever. And notice here it doesn't include kingdom. For thine is the power and the glory forever. And then whoever wrote it says, pray this three times a day. So in early Christianity, into the second century, uh, at least however far this document may have circulated, uh, there was the, the encouragement for Christians to pray the Lord's Prayer three times a day. Now, there obviously would be some value to that. There might also be some disadvantage uh, to doing that. But <clears throat> notice that the emphasis here uh, in this paragraph that I read is we don't want you to fast and pray like the hypocrites do. And particularly, we don't want you fasting on the same days that they fast. Of course, that's Mondays and Thursdays, but fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. But the concern here, uh, as it is in the Gospel of Matthew, is we don't want you to be like hypocrites. And notice, as we said, that the word kingdom is missing in the prayer. And this gives us an, uh, an early indication that probably the Lord's Prayer was part of congregational praying and individual praying as early as the early 2nd century. So it goes, it goes way back, and it was understood to function that way. And it's interesting, notice that even as today, that instead of looking at the prayer as a framework for prayer, uh, too often it's only repeated as the prayer, okay? Now, nothing wrong with that. Uh, in fact, that goes along with the practice of what I call prayerizing scripture. Which if you've not done that, I, I would encourage you to do that. That you actually let the text of scripture become part of your daily prayer. Very rich indeed if you haven't done that. Um, but that's not the only way to pray. And I doubt that Jesus' original intention was that these words be the only thing we ever pray. Uh, I can pretty well say that wasn't his intention. Okay. Yeah, Joe? Prayer 15 times. Yeah, yeah. Well, and again, see, that becomes, I think, a misuse of what the prayer was all about. Uh, because if you see it, how can I say? Uh, yeah, and if you, if you see it almost as having not just a magical power to it, but even, even as uh, some meritorious work where you, whereby you you gain forgiveness and grace because you've said it so many times. Again, I think that just totally misses what Jesus was after here. And that's why we have to uh, be careful uh, of, of abusing it. And, and, it can, and see, it can be done in both directions. I think, I think there's a problem if you never refer to it. <laughs> Which I think some people have steered away from it because of the other misuse and abuse of it. So I don't think we want to go either direction. what is called liturgical, that which has been issued from the church that you have to do. You oh, yeah, oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, it's not a choice thing at that point. Well, we, that, could, that could be, listen, I'm afraid to open the door here. That could be a whole lesson in itself. There, again, there's a value to that, but also a disadvantage to it. Um, it's, it's funny, years ago I heard someone say this, churches of Christ claim to be non-liturgical even with their liturgical forms. And all that liturgy means, generally the way it's used, is that there is a set form of worship when people assemble on Sunday morning. And, and we're that way, we have a set form. Um, and, but we're like everybody else. If we're not careful, we can slip, and think about this, we can slip into the mindset that says, if I just go through the correct form and perform it that morning, I'm okay. That's the problem, isn't it? That all that God's looking for is I just go through the right motions, get her done, that <laughs> kind of mentality, and then I can go on my merry way. Well, I don't believe that's ever what God intended. And then leave. <laughs> they got that done, yeah, yeah. 
Oh, but, but and, and I see what you're saying, Bill, that if, if people feel like that their, think about this, that their experience of, co- of communal faith is only done through forms that they feel like they're forced to do, and it doesn't have any meaning to them. I mean, think of how empty that gets pretty quickly. I mean, that would for anybody. Uh, and so what, what we want, I, I think what I'm trying to propose here is we're ending our study of the Lord's Prayer is, uh, in my study over these last two months, um, I have come to appreciate this prayer more than I ever did in my life. This, this prayer is amazing. And not just the, the repeating of it, but looking at what each section provides, and I, 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 this is the point I'm trying to make is, I believe it's a wonderful framework to look at the larger sections of our prayer life. Uh, for example, as we end this prayer, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever, amen, are we really aware that we're ascribing to God what needs to be ascribed to God in our prayer life? And do we spend a little bit of time in our prayer life giving God the glory? That's pretty rich. That's, yeah, that's a good attributes. More at the beginning, more sure. The um, yeah, and that's okay too. Uh, but you're right. I think our, I think our habit is more at the beginning. Yeah, but that's what I think this prayer calls us to, is an awareness of that part of our prayer life, and what we're ascribing to God. Okay, um, let's look at this concept of kingdom. Of course, we don't live in a kingdom. Uh, we, we live in a nation, uh, and we don't think of king and kingdom. But Israel understood very clearly the claim of God's kingship. I mean, that was part of their identity as God's people. When you talk about God and king, they knew that. Now, here's where Israel, though, if you remember your history in the Old Testament... They began to look around at the, at the pagan nations surrounding them. And uh, all of a sudden, they began to desire a king. Uh, they wanted a king like everybody else. And, I've, and, and though scripture doesn't get into this, you would love to know, and you can almost guess, you would love to know what the national psyche was, that as you're a nation sitting here with all these other powerful pagan nations around you, and you don't have a king, but they do. <laughs> so I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure it did a number on their national psyche. Like, oh, if we just had a king, we could feel better about ourselves, you know. Well, but they had a king. They had a, well, not not like they wanted. That was their problem. They they rejected. <laughs> they thought they did. Ooh, it's interesting you say it that way because guess what? As you look at Israel's history then, from the time that God said, okay, you're intent on this, so I'm going to give you your king. From that point on through the rest of the Old Testament, I think they're learning that very lesson. If God indeed is sovereign king, they've had to learn the lesson the hard way. There are no competitions. God told them what was going to happen if they had a king, a physical king. He was going to they, increase, increase their taxes. He was going to conscript their sons to go into war. Well, you know what that does? That reminds me of parents reminding their kids what's going to happen. <laughs> if you do this, this is going to happen. You know, they just dismissed it. Oh, we need a king. And it's so funny because even though God warns them, if you, if you have a king, here's what's going to happen. They're like, no, we still want one. And this is interesting to me. See, God could have said, I know you really, really want one, but you're not getting one. See, he could have put his foot down. He doesn't, though. God knows what's going to happen to him as a nation. He says, okay, go at it. And look at the results. Oh, he gave him a choice. But it's also a reminder that the masses are not always correct. <laughs> and it also shows that they steal people even though that 
that was put upon them who still followed God. Yeah. Yeah. You still, yeah. Well, and, yeah, and those, those in leadership should have stepped forward at that moment and said, look, I, we know what you all want, but this is what God wants. We're following God. But they did cave in, didn't they? They just weren't kings. They just weren't kings. Well, that wasn't good enough, though. I mean, because they, they had people yeah. to lead them. Well, and led them down the wrong path. They're, well, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, the judges were basically, you know, appointed by God. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and this is what we're saying is, you know, God's right to exercise power and authority and receive glory um, dovetails right into not only who God is, but it is the response from his created order. And that because God is the king, he's the creator, uh, he's the initiator, he's the, the potentate, um, he, he receives that right. Um, Someone has said, I thought this was really interesting, that the pronouncing of these words at the end of the Lord's Prayer demonstrate the beginning of submission to God. Um, I don't know if I would say it that way or not, but, but to think that because you have prayed these words in the prayer, you are recognizing you're submissive to Almighty God. And so that Part of the Lord's Prayer um, is designed to make us aware of that. And I find it fascinating that that is at least a door that we can open here because I think that one of the greatest lessons we have to learn in our prayer life is submission to God. Because too often, and, and for a lot of people it's this way, the only view they have of prayer is that it is sort of either a spiritual fire escape or it's what we used to call the Sears Robot Catalog order form. <laughs> of course, now it's Amazon, you know, just click on what I want or whatever I can get off of Craigslist. You know, it, it, we, kind of, we kind of view prayer that way. All I have to do is reach up and click, you know, and I, I fill all the boxes in and get what I want. But is that really what prayer is? Uh, if we begin to think of prayer I mean, this is an amazing thing to think of. Could it be that prayer is the avenue in which God chooses, not the only one, but an important avenue in which God chooses to shape and mold us and change us into His image of His Son? See, I, I think for so often or for so long, we tend to think prayer is something at my disposal so I can change God's thinking. Now, and, and in, in, the, in Scripture, we see that. God changes his thinking, you know, in response to prayer. But is that the only reason for prayer? Is that the only time I pray to God because I want God to, to do something and change his thinking? Or is there another element of it that's just as important that God desires that my heart change because I'm engaging in prayer? Ooh. It, it took me years to get that point. I, that one was too personal. <laughs> You know, I wanted answers to prayer. Forget about it changing me. I wanted other things changed, not me. And that's usually how we tend to approach it. So the key. Conflict of our understanding. Uh, we have a hard time understanding how Jesus was 100% deity and 100% human. Yeah. And in this relationship that we have today uh, with God, we are in this physical world and we have to deal with that physical world yeah. and yet we're in the spiritual world. I know. And so we have this duality of our lives that sometimes conflicts itself. Well, and um, what's today? Today's Wednesday. Yesterday in the car on the way back home, Nancy and I were talking about this very thing. And I said, I've come to the point in my life where and maybe you, you guys have been there for a long time. If you have, I'm, I'm behind the curve. But have you ever noticed there's a lot of things in Scripture that's not spelled out? And I think it's by God's design that His desire is that the spiritual life be one of struggle. 
that I get to the point where I am with God through intense personal struggle. And the connection between that, though, is prayer. Yes, it is. That's the lifeline. Yes, it is. Prayer is the lifeline. Uh, and, and that's why it's so important to have this submissive attitude through prayer, isn't it? Because it may be that what I'm going through is intense struggle. It may be the result of something I did, and so therefore I'm just experiencing natural consequences. It may be, as the Hebrew writer says, uh, God uh, participating in uh, the, cha the chastening of one of his children. We have to hold that possibility open. Uh, just a lot of things that, that we need to be aware of when the struggle occurs, and prayer is right in the middle of all of that. It seems to me that, that something that doesn't cost you anything is not worth anything. Right. And so, with our spiritual lives, it, he, set, he set it up that way. Because if it came easy to us, then after we got what we felt we needed out of it, we'd push it aside and we wouldn't feel like we wouldn't need it anymore. Exactly. We would just push it aside. Wouldn't mean anything. Now, uh, let me ask it this way, or, or, or make this comment for you to think about. Think about right now where you are spiritually. And if we had time, it'd be neat to, to go around the audience tonight and for each of us to share several lessons that have been what I call the hard-won lessons of life in Christ. What have been those hard lessons you've struggled with? Uh, and, and yet, even though they were hard and they were difficult, sometimes very painful, but had you not gone through those, you wouldn't be where you are right now. And so in a sense, it's a blessing in disguise. Although at the time you were going through it, the word blessing was not what came to your mind. <laughs> you know. But God can work through that. So in, in God's, in this prayer of the Lord's Prayer, God's kingship is recognized by the words that we say and it demonstrates our submission to God. Uh, Barclay again says this, we end the prayer by recognizing that God is king, that we are subjects, and by pledging our obedience and our allegiance to him. Uh, here's what struck me when I read that uh, quote. I think at a certain level, we understood that at our baptism, didn't we? And as we've gotten older, we've come to understand uh, our obedience and allegiance to God at a, at a much deeper level. But if we, if we view that time of baptism and that moment of commitment as pledging our obedience and allegiance to God is the only time we do that, we may have sold short... Um, the beginning of the journey that baptism kind of ushers us onto, okay? So that perhaps there are ways, and the, the Lord's Prayer here, the ending might be one of the ways to remind us, that we need to remind ourselves periodically, God, I am pledging my heart's ongoing obedience to you, my ultimate allegiance is to you. And today in my prayer, I want to reaffirm that to you. Maybe we need to say that more often. Because uh, sometimes we just assume things, and after a while, what's assumed too long just sort of slips off the shelf, doesn't it? Have you ever noticed that? Pledge allegiance to the flag, which I did every day of my life when I was in elementary school. Oh, okay. I had great reverence for the flag yeah. at that time. And now nobody does it. In fact, it's an affront if you ask someone <laughs> to do it. Okay. And therefore, we have a flag. Yeah. And, you know, nobody respects the flag. Yeah. Uh, but it, that practice was based on the realization that the pledge of the allegiance being said every day was important. It, it, it contained words that meant something and was supposed to help be a part of your thinking and how you were living. And to your nation. Yeah. Right, right, right. Um, 
and I wish we had time tonight to go into all. I'm just amazed. I, I took time. Yeah. Does that literally mean kingdom? Yeah. Because when Young translates it, he translates it as reign. Well, now we're. Well, reign would be the verb. Okay. Kingdom is the noun. Yeah. At least in English. I mean, you know. It's funny how we have to do things with English. Um, right there, uh, well, that's, that's just the man, kingdom. But in, in Matthew, uh, well, let's start off. And, and we don't have time to look at it. I've got to remember, is it 33 times? Is that the right one? That the idea of kingdom comes up all over the book of Matthew. And it gives us an insight into what the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. A lot of people say those are exact parallels because they're used a lot together. But uh, look at Matthew chapter 3, verse 22, is it? Nope, didn't have that many verses. Verse 2, <laughs> not 22. Yeah. In these days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, of course, he's, he's quoting from one of the prophets, but he is preparing the way for Jesus. And isn't it interesting that he could say, the kingdom of heaven is near. And you stop and you think, okay, now, John, what are you saying? Well, he's saying a lot of things with that expression. That Jesus came in the name of the Father for the fulfillment of scripture for putting flesh on what the kingdom is uh, for preaching good news of the kingdom uh, the proclamation that the kingdom is near was part of the good news but the kingdom itself is good news that's why when we when we talk to people and I have boy Monday and Tuesday I have an opportunity to talk to a lot of people about spiritual stuff. It's amazing how funerals will do that. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised, some, maybe I shouldn't be, but I'm often surprised by the fundamental questions that people ask, things that most of us you know, in church we've been for a lot of years, uh, we tend to take for granted. But what it also tells me is probably more now, that I think 40 years ago, when I first began ministry 42 years ago, uh, there were a lot of people, I mean, you were either Christian or pagan and that was it. Well, it seems like now there's this huge, massive group in between now where there's a lot of questions being asked by a lot of people who don't have traditional church background. And that can be exciting. Uh, be prepared for unusual questions, though, because <laughs> they're not going to come at it from a traditional perspective. But there's a part of me with my interaction with people that feels like they are hungering and thirsting for something that's good news beyond what they can see and hear now. Because they know, in many instances, politics isn't the good news. It doesn't matter which side of the fence you're on. <laughs> they, that's not the good news. They know there's got to be something better. Um, and it's for me my eyes were opened a few years ago when I had a funeral the graveside service was way out in Podunk Holler I mean you, you can't get there from here it was way out there and after the graveside service there was a young lady who came up to me and she must have been you know, probably in her early 30s but, but she said you mean to tell me that there is life after death I said yeah she said, I need to know more about that. And she said, no, I've got to leave in 15 minutes, but that, I want to know. So in 15 minutes, I said, oh, Lord, you've got to help me here. <laughs> I tried to give her, just off the top of my head for 15 minutes, the good news of the hope of Jesus and the resurrection. It was all new to her. She hadn't heard any of it. And I guarantee you, there are a lot of people today that are in that same situation. They don't know the good news, never heard it, don't know what it's like. 
And um, maybe we need to be more open to sharing that if we could find an opportunity and people are, see, that's the thing. This young lady was open to it. I'm like, wow, you know, not everybody's that open to come up to you and say, I want to know more about that. Um, so when we talk about the kingdom, it is God at work. And there's so much more we could say in Matthew, but just to let you know that briefly, um, this whole concept uh, is, is just critical. Now, let's, um, okay, let's, look at, let's look at power, kingdom. Uh, the word dynamite comes for power. This is the word that's translated power. For thine is the kingdom and the power. Uh, we end this prayer by reminding ourselves of the dynamic power of God. It affirms our belief in God's power to act. Now think about that. The reason we pray is because we believe in God's divine power to act. Having said that, I can't tell you how he's going to act. <laughs> I mean, and we need to hear this, okay? Ministers don't have a closer line to heaven. Uh, I was shocked my first church. There was a lady who came up to me. She said, I need for you to pray for me. I'd be glad to do that. And she said, um, I know you've got a, um, a closer line to the guy upstairs than I do. I said, really? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, that's the, that, I mean, that's what we believe with the priesthood of all believers. Everybody has an equal line to God. So, but it, but it affirms our belief in the power of God to act. We, we, and, and think about the difference that it makes. What if we believe tonight, here we are, we're gathering in Jesus' name, but part of our Christian faith was we, we didn't believe that God acted really to our prayer. God didn't respond to prayer. Boy, that'd make a huge difference, wouldn't it? God does respond to prayer. He's going to act. And... Part of my prayer life is to be submissive, submit myself to the decision of how God's going to act. Um, and that sometimes is very difficult. Which means we, be, we bring both trust and confidence to God in our prayer life. We believe that God is going to act. Let's see. Then the glory... When we get to the glory, we use the word glory loosely. Um, sometimes with some kind of honor and reputation of fame that a person achieves. But God receives glory uniquely for who he is and what he has done and what he continues to do. And we end the prayer by reminding ourselves that we're in the presence of the divine glory. Um, Barclay says this. We must live life in the reverence which never forgets that it is living within the splendor of the glory of God. Now, that, that did a number on my mental image when I first read that. It's almost as if you can see yourself walking around in the glow of God. Now, think of the difference. You walk outside, you're in the sunshine. And you walk under the, the tree or you walk under the, the driveway and... No more sunshine. Well, for the Christian, it's not like you're in and out. For the Christian, you're living in the splendor and the glory of God. Uh, one French writer called it uh, the glory of the present moment. The glory of the present moment. The moment that we're living in right now, we are in God's glory. And as a result of that, we give glory to God. And there's a lot of neat things about this concept of glory just in Matthew's gospel. In Matthew 4 and verse 8, if you look there, you may know this is the temptation narrative, but, but especially verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. Now, we shouldn't go over this too quickly because this sets you up for this dynamic conflict through the whole Gospel of Matthew. That the kingdoms of this world and what Satan views as sort of his territory and his kingdom, it is much different 
than the kingdom of God. And here Jesus is right in the middle of all of this. You know, he represents God's kingdom. Uh, John the Baptist just said earlier, you know, the kingdom of God is near. So here he is. But he's also, Satan thinks, is being offered all the kingdoms of the world that he can't have. And Satan believes he has the power to give it to Jesus. That always tickles me when I read this. I always want to say, now, Satan, stop a minute. Do you not realize who you're talking to? It's, it's really ironic in the narrative, isn't it? Don't you realize who you're talking to? Now look at Matthew 6, 29. Why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his glory was dressed like one of these. Again, a fascinating contrast between what we would take as human pomp and circumstance and glory and a king dressed up like Solomon in all his glory. And look what Jesus says. I want you to think about the lilies of the field. Now that's the glory of God. Isn't that interesting? Uh, this, this, is, this is an insight into a major concept in Matthew's gospel. And that is sort of upside down values and worldview. Who in their right mind would say that all of the kingly finery in Solomon is not greater than a lily of the field? Look at the two. I mean, my, look at the difference. Jesus said, yeah, look at the difference. If you can really see the difference, where is the real glory and splendor? It's in that lily of the field. It's not in what Solomon got all dressed up in. Which is not man-made. It's not man-made. No. It goes back to God and his glory as... Well, here, here's the interesting thing. Boy, this is another lesson too. Think about how God's glory sort of comes out in different arenas. For example, the glory of God in creation. When you go back and you read the uh, Genesis narrative of creation, chapters 1 and 2, if that doesn't give you a sense of wonder and awe emanating from the very power and glory of God, I don't know what would. Because that's the perspective it's written from. So this, there's this contrast in Matthew 6.29 that is set up for us between what God offers and uh, what is given. Let's see. I want to look at somehow. Okay, I've got a section that's not here, and I don't know why. Um, it's on the forever and ever amen section. This is the agreement to put an exclamation point on the end of the prayer. Someone has said that there are consequences to saying Amen. To amen someone is to offer the nod of affirmation. It's a nod that will accompany appropriate behavior, changes in lifestyle and relationships. You didn't know all that was wrapped up in the kernel of an amen, did you? James Mulholland suggests that it's like standing before Christ as our bride and saying, I do and I will. It puts us in a position to repeat our covenant vows by the way we live before God. Um, we've, got, we've got just a minute. Jump over to Deuteronomy 27. This, this is really interesting. Because this is where the whole group of the covenant people of God get involved in an amen. Kind of a neat story here. Deuteronomy chapter 27. This is the altar on Mount Ebal. Moses and the elders of Israel commanded the people, keep all these commands that I give you today. And he says, uh, don't cast any iron tool upon the altar that you give. Um, and then jump down. Uh, let's see. The Levites shall recite to all the people of Israel in a loud voice. 
and this is what they'll recite. Cursed is the man. This is way down in verse, um, what is that, 15. Cursed is the man who carves an image or casts an idol, a thing detestable to the Lord, the work of the craftsman's hands, and sets it up in secret. Then shall all the people say, Amen. Cursed is the man who dishonors his father or mother. Then all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the man who moves his neighbor's boundary stone. Then all the people shall say, Amen. Well, let me pause there for a second. Do you realize how strongly ethical these guidelines are for living and the curses that come as a result if you break these? Cursed is the man who leads the blind astray on the road. Then all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the man who withholds justice from the alien, the fatherless, or the widow. Then all the people shall say, Amen. So it just goes all the way down through all of this. Cursed is the man, this is the last one. Cursed is the man who does not uphold the words of the law by carrying them out. Then all the people shall say, Amen. They were making a covenant agreement with that Amen. It was a serious Amen. Amen. Yeah, it's, um, yes, it comes into Greek and it comes into English, but as amen. So be it. So be it. Let it be. Um, I agree. Something like that. Um, this study of the Lord's Prayer um, has been really enlightening. I, I've come to appreciate it at the depth I never did before. Um, we, we saw tonight that the ending probably is the early church's response to the first part of it. But in very ancient use, you, we can understand why it survived, what it means, and it really helps to frame the prayer. It sounds like a prayer with that ending. Um, but notice that the prayer itself ascribes, asks, and offers. And as I suggested as we started off tonight, the Lord's Prayer, you can, you can pray the words, let that be a prayer, but also... Be aware of the bigger framework that it provides. Uh, it enables us to ask the kind of questions we need to ask of our prayer life in general. Um, and for tonight, being aware of the, the God that we pray to. And when we say, Amen, what, what, are, we, what are we affirming? Are we just mouthing words? Or do we want this prayer to certainly and it, both the words and its framework to guide our life so that as we live out the covenant life before God as individual and as part of the body of Christ, that this prayer keeps us on track and enables us to be shaped and molded more and more into the image of God. I mean, what, a, what a powerful prayer. Any comment or question as we, as we end tonight? Last, we've got about a minute. Anybody want to... Uh, say something about the Lord's Prayer. What prayers do we have of Jesus? Just two? Okay. The one in the garden. Well, we also have, is it um, John 17, the, the prayer for unity. But that one doesn't, that one that one's more of Jesus in conversation with God. I need to go back and check and see how that one's framed. But, but yeah, as, as actual prayer, oh, I wanted to mention to you, there's a reference, I think it's in Luke. And this is fascinating. Uh, I, I want to encourage you not to dismiss out of hand old resources. <laughs> okay. If you come across an old a Bible study book or an old commentary work. just because it's old don't dismiss it uh, I was given uh, a couple years ago uh, a two volume set by someone here in the congregation who, who found I believe it's 18 I have to check the dates it's 1848 two volume set of companion a companion to the Bible school teacher, I forget the exact title, but it was written for Bible school teachers as a resource. In one of these volumes, as I was beginning to read through it, whoever compiled them referenced John Wesley and said that Wesley 
commented on the passage in Luke about Jesus' prayer, where it says Jesus was in prayer all night to God, that literally that expression, I went back to check it because I was like, whoa, that one reference in Luke is the only time in the New Testament where it says Jesus was all night in the prayer of God. Literally, it's not to God, it's in the prayer of God. And that Wesley suggests that what that really means is not, it's not emphasizing content or practice. It's emphasizing the very presence of God. He's in the prayer of God, which is kind of a cool expression. It makes you wonder what, what the writer was actually trying to convey. Because we certainly wouldn't say it that way. But if Jesus indeed is an individual whose life was steeped in the prayer of God, uh, hopefully this prayer... Uh, will enable us to do that too. Let, let's bow together in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight just so grateful for the opportunity of prayer itself. So many things to be said about prayer. The mystery of it, the power of it, the transforming power of it toward us. When we pray as we have finished this study of the Lord's Prayer that it will enable us to take a deeper look into our prayer life and practices. And that we, as we take that seriously, not only can we pray the prayer itself, but also use it as a framework to constantly be vigilant about the various aspects of our prayer life. Thank you, God, for being our Heavenly Father. And as we end this prayer tonight, we do ascribe to you the power and the glory and the kingdom. And all of this is in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you all for being here tonight.